Network, the solution for humanity. Who is going to take care of the wives? Why God created us? What is cosmic energy? The religion is the solution for the things happening all around the world. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim. Jihad basically means to strive to struggle. The Hindus and the Muslims will be united. He is not cosmic energy, he is more superior than that. Quran gives you the solution to the problems of humankind. Not that we shall despise each other. But according to Japan, India will be the superpower of the world. We will be a superpower, will be far superior to the Americans. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, amma abad, a'udhu billahi minish shaitani rajeem, bismillahi rahman rahim, wa min ahasunu kawla mimman dhu ila allahi, ma'amil salihun, kawla inna ni min muslimin, rabbi shuhli sadri, wa yassirli amri, wa halu al-udata min lisani yafqahu kawli. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion. So brothers and sisters, if you have any questions, they are most welcome. Yes, brother. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam. I just mean for the pilgrim to Mecca. So with that niya, we can go around with other pilgrim places. Is it possible? So it will deflate our niya, is it? Well, there is a question that if I go pilgrimage for Mecca, can I go for other pilgrim places? See, if you think pilgrim places, in the hadith, the only way you can go for a distance of traveling, the three holy places, Makkah, Madinah, and Majid Aqsa. So that, if you go, no problem. With pilgrim, you can do sightseeing also, no problem. No problem. You can go and see the other massages, no problem. But the main niya is hajj. You perform the hajj, no problem. So main niya is hajj. Before, after that, you go to any other place, no problem. As long as the place is not involving shirk. And wrong things, you know. Otherwise, no problem. There's no problem at all. But a main niya is hajj. A main niya should be hajj. While doing hajj, you can even do business. You can even do sightseeing. You can even go to other places. You can visit the other mass massages. There's no problem at all. But now if you're going and spending so much money, you say, fine, now there's a close country. We want to visit that country also. We want to visit Saudi. While coming, we want to go to Egypt. I mean, there's no problem. Egypt is sightseeing only. No problem at all. Hope that's the question. I need a clarification. I mean, I'm not so sure about it. The Jews uh, believe in the Old Testament, isn't it? And uh, the Christians don't uh, follow the Old Testament. What is the logic behind this? And uh, can you explain, I mean, uh, why they don't consider the Old Testament important and is the New Testament that they take into consideration when the Jews take on to the Old Testament? The Buddha is saying that Jews take on to the Old Testament. The Christians, they're supposed to follow the Old Testament. Why do they only stick on to the New Testament? Brother, just as I outlined, the Bible is in two parts, the Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament deals with the lifestyle of the prophets that came before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. New Testament, it starts the life of Jesus, peace be upon him, and about his apostles and all. So there are two divisions. Now, the Jews are supposed to follow the Torah, the Psalms, everything that is there. That is the complete Old Testament. So Jews are sticking to that. Now, as far as the Christians are concerned, theoretically they have to follow both. If they don't follow both, the whole Christianity will fall apart. Why? Because whatever is in the New Testament, it is based on the Old Testament. The prophecy of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they claim that he is God, so whatever they claim. So their claim is only supported by the prophecy of the Old Testament, which we disclaim. We say these prophecies are about the prophet coming, not about a God coming. Based on the Old Testament is the New Testament built. Without the Old Testament, the New Testament on its own doesn't have any value. So many of the Christians don't know about this. So theoretically, without the Old Testament, for Jesus Christ says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. Till heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle can pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever shall break one of the least commandments shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep the commandments and treat the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So according to Jesus Christ, unless you are not more pure than the Jews, unless you don't follow all the laws and commandments of the Jews, you cannot go to paradise. So if you take out the laws of the Jews, how can you go to paradise? So according to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. So theoretically, they have to follow. If they don't follow, they cannot be a good Christian. They cannot enter paradise. So they have to. Sorry. No, they have to say theoretically. But practically, when we argue with them and prove to them that from the Old Testament, 
you come to know about the Prophet the Muhammad Sallam. No, we don't follow the Old Testament. These people who don't have much knowledge, but a knowledgeable person cannot say that. Because if they don't follow the Old Testament, the New Testament itself carries no weight. Because if the New Testament says that you have to follow what is in the law of the Musa Read the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of John, Gospel of all these Gospels, what Jesus Christ said, that it has been said of the old times. Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you. So what has been said of the old times? Something Jesus Christ has made his own statements. But as a whole, he said that you have to follow each and every law of the Old Testament. If you break one jot or tittle, you shall not enter Jannah. So if you don't have that law, how can you follow? So theoretically and practically, they have to follow, but they don't do it. So theoretically, they may give importance, but practically, when you argue with them, those who have less knowledge, then they say, okay, we only follow New Testament. So we can even prove about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the New Testament. We can prove Jesus Christ was not crucified, peace be upon him, from the New Testament. So if you are well-versed with comparative religion, even without the Old Testament, you can yet convince them what is not from the New Testament, if you are well-versed. But actually, practically, they have to follow both. Hope that answers the question. Any sisters have any questions? Assalamu alaikum, brother. Uh, Wa alaikum assalam, This is question regarding Ramadan and fast. Uh, like uh, ladies who are menstruating, they are not able to have all the fast in the month of Ramadan, so they have to kala. But for example, like uh, I started my fast a day earlier than Bombay because I started from Madras. So can that be considered for one extra fast can be calculated in the kala? Or I know a friend who started from here and went to a part of Tamil Nadu where there is conflicting of two uh, fasts. Like uh, they did only 28 and celebrated Eid. So uh, does he has to do two more kalas or like, uh, can you explain about that? This is the fast that you start in the month of Ramadan. Whichever part of the world you are in, you start along with the Jama of that area. So if you are in Saudi Arabia, Ramadan starts from there, you can start from there. When it comes here, you end here. But if it becomes more than the required, for example, previously, normally two days earlier they used to start. If I am in Saudi Arabia, I start two days earlier and then come to Bombay. And then if I end with Bombayites, then in the end I fast 32. So then the option is given to me, they cannot be more than 30 days, either 29 or 30 days. So if it comes to more than 30, the last two fasts of Bombay, I can either keep or I can keep as nafil extra fast. That cannot be further fast. Similarly, if you start in Bombay and then end in Saudi, so I start two days late and it's too fast, I'm keeping less, 28 days. So that I have to make kaza after Ramadan. So what you have missed, you have to, but you can't make kaza before. You can't make kada before, so I haven't heard of making kada before, so that's not right. So if you have missed the fast during the menstruation, you have to keep it after Ramadan, you can't give it before. The before fast, optional fast, unless it is part and parcel. If you go back to Saudi Arabia before Ramadan ends, so that becomes part of the first rosa you have kept, but you can't do kada before. But if suppose there's a problem, like the moon has been sighted and you start in Saudi, maybe one day earlier, and you come here, and suppose... The moon, they decide, okay, fine, we start Ramadan one day late. And Ramadan of that time was only 28 days. So the Muslims of Bombay, after Eid is over, they have to fast one day extra. Now, because I started one day earlier being in Saudi Arabia, I need not keep that Qadar Roza. Is it clear? Because I started one day earlier. But you cannot say that I'm going to fast the advanced fast and count it as a Qadar. That cannot be acted as a Qadar. That's what you started. But one thing is their sister. Now, because you started in Saudi Arabia one day earlier, that is part of your Ramadan. So if there are 30 days, in Saudi Arabia 30 days, and in Bombay 30 days, and if you start one day earlier, and then in Bombay if you miss five days, so actually the last one day that you're keeping in Bombay is extra roda. So that can be counted as a Qadar roda. Do you understand? Means you start suppose two days early in Saudi Arabia, and 30 days was the month of Ramadan in Saudi Arabia. You come here and you continue, and in between you miss about six fasts because of your cycles. But you are supposed to end on 30. Now two options you have got. The last two fasts of Bombay don't keep. Or you keep those two fasts as Qadha. So that can be acted as Qadha. Is it clear? So finally if the Bombayites have maintained 30 days. But if there it is 30 days, here 29, so at least 30 you have to keep. So 30 you can keep. If it's more than 30, then that can be counted in the extra fast and can be included. That you have to do Qadha less. So that's not an early Qadha, you started on time with Saudi Arabia. But if you say that being in Bombay, if I start two days earlier, that cannot be counted as Qadha. Because if you're in Saudi Arabia and you start along with the Jama there, that can be counted as a Fard Roza. But the last two Rozas that you keep, if it's more than 30, 
that can be counted as excess rosa, and that can be counted in the Qatar rosa. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yes, in a lunar month, Islamic month, it can't be 28 days. Either 29 or 30. So if it's 28 days, you come to know that we started one day late. We have to keep. But if we see the moon like this, is moon, we say, oh, the moon was a bit big. It should have been, it is actually a second day moon. So it should have been 30 days. We kept 29. So that's nothing of Qadha for that. If you keep 29, even if you come to know it started one day late, then nothing, no requirement of Qadha. Because we didn't see the moon. To start Ramadan, you have to see the moon. But then we realize at the end of the month that 28 days we see the new moon. It can't be possible. So it's a confirmed fact that we started one day late. Then we have to keep Qadha. You understand? Because there's a hadith of the Prophet that when the Saba started the Ramadan, he saw that, okay, this is the moon of the second day. So Prophet said, don't think like that. Maybe Allah made it much more. You can say, fatter. So you don't have that doubt in your heart that we started Ramadan late. You think we started on time, maybe Allah made it bigger. And one more thing, that if you miss the new moon, just by a few minutes, the next day moon will look like a two-day moon. I mean, that's but logic. When the new moon came, but because of the sun was present, you could not see the new moon. And you can't see it. And scientifically, with the telescope also, you can't see. So if you just miss it by a couple of minutes, the next day moon will be like a two-day moon. So people would think, oh, you know, this is a two-day moon, we started one day late, all these are their own hypothesis, they don't know science very well. So if you miss the new moon, even by a few minutes, you cannot see it. The next day moon will be a two-day moon. So all these are hypotheses. Hope that's the question. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Uh, this could be a fake question, uh, but I, I require some scientific uh, explanation for this. In a lot of uh, developing towns, there is a shortage of water. So they have uh, come up, the, the local authorities, they have come up, come up with STPs. Water comes out of it, they say it is pure. Except drinking, you can use it for taking bath and uh, washing clothes. So I just wanted to know, is it a permissible Islamic way because the water is treated from the, you know, impure water? It is allowed? Well, that's a question that because like the water, they take out from the sewage water and they treat it in a way that it becomes pure for everything except drinking. Now, you should realize that there are certain requirements for drinking water, about the contents and mineral content, etc. So the water they take out from tube well. Even there they say it is not safe for drinking. For washing clothes, bath, no problem. So that is because for drinking it's not pure. But otherwise, the Islamic aspect is that when you put dirt in the ocean, the ocean doesn't become dirty, that water becomes clear. So similarly, if they make a treatment such a way that the impurities are removed, then it becomes pure, no problem. I'm just giving you a simple example. There's sewage water. Fine. It is dirty. It evaporates. It turns into cloud. The cloud water coming down is pure or not. So that is Allah's purification system, evaporation, and getting down. You take it, it's 100% pure, even for drinking. Unless there are some problems in the pollution, etc. Now they are adopting a system and purifying it. It should be pure. Having a bar, doing wudu, no problem. So Islam is no problem at all. Hope that answers the question. Allah purifies by evaporation. So you know the dirt and feces, etc. in the muck and and some area and it's evaporating, it becomes clear. So they also do a somewhat similar system with the purified, so no problem at all. Hope that answers the question. Who was the first prophet? Was a prophet the first one to read and write? Did God speak to a prophet? A prophet in a prison. A prophet who commanded the birds, insects, and animals? Want to know more? Join us for Stories of the Prophet. Stories of the Prophets every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. There is a need is a to, need. See, what to see what Islam says about human rights. About human rights. Kindness and care. Justice for peace. Human brotherhood. The Book of Allah, the Glorious Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Protecting humanity at large and promoting peaceful coexistence. These are the two main sources for getting the human rights. Dr. Rights. Ahmad ibn Safuddin. Islam has come with a complete system of protecting human rights under the Sharia. Realize the progressive Islamic insights in Human Rights, a Muslim Perspective, next on Peace TV.
السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام و رحمت اللہ ون ہندو بردر واز آسکنگ می اباؤٹ دا اسلامک سسٹم آف میرج مینس آل آف فور میریجز ہاؤ کین آئی گیو ہم سیٹسفیکٹری آئی انسل اینڈ ہاؤ کین وی پروو دیٹ از دا موسٹ کریکٹ اینڈ موسٹ سوٹیبل بز آسٹ ویری کامن کوشچن دیٹ ہاؤ کین آئی کنونس نان مسلم دیٹ اسلام گز پرمیشن ٹو ہیو مور دین ون وائف فور وائف ہاؤ کین آئی کنونس ہم ہاؤ کین آئی پروو دیٹ دس از دا بیسٹ نو ور دا اسلام سے دیٹ فور میریج از دا بیسٹ or Islam gives permission. In fact, Quran is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. You read all the other scriptures, whether you read the Mahabharat, Ramayan, Bhagavad Gita, Bible, no religious scripture on the face of the earth says marry only one except the Quran. If you read the Hindu scriptures, Ramayan, the father of Ram, King Dashrath, he had three wives. Krishna, how many wives he had? Four, ten, twenty, thousand, sixteen thousand one hundred and eight wives. So Krishna had 16,108 wives, so why can't you Muslim have at least four? So what is the problem? If you read the Christian scriptures, Christian scriptures, if you read the Bible, Solomon had 700 wives, Abraham in the Bible had three wives. So in Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, you can marry as many wives as you wish, four, five, ten, thousand, ten thousand, no upper limit. It is later on, the Christian church, which put a ban and said that the Christian should not marry more than one. It is the Jewish rabbi, mentioned in Yehuda, he passed the synod that the Jews should not marry more than one wife. Otherwise, in 1950, in the Jewish community, in the Sephardic communities, where Jews live with Muslims, there the Jews had more than one wife. It is later on when the synod was passed that they stopped it. Even Hindus, according to the scriptures, they can marry as many as they wish. It is the Indian Penal Code in 1954, which passed the law called Hindu Marriage Act, that a Hindu cannot marry more than one wife. It is the Indian government But the Hindu scriptures give you permission, you can marry as many as you wish. And if you read the census of the status of women in Islam, on page number 66 and 67 it says that the polygamous marriages there in a span of 10 years between 1951 to 1961, the Muslims had 4.31. 4.31% of the Muslims, they did polygamous marriages, they married more than one. The Hindus was 5.06. The Hindus did more polygamous marriages as compared to the Muslims in a span of 10 years between 1951 to 1961. So if you read the Quran, as I mentioned, Quran is the only religious book which says marry only one. If you read the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 3, it says, marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. So this statement, marry only one, is only given in the Quran and no other religious scripture. But the Quran also says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 129, that it is difficult to do justice between your wives. But don't turn away from them altogether. So you can marry more than one wife on the condition that you can do justice between them. So marrying more than one wife is not further than Islam. It is optional. It's not compulsory. It's optional. If you marry, no problem. But if you marry, you should do justice. So let us analyze the various logical and scientific reasons that why Islam gives permission for certain men to have more than one wife. If you analyze, by nature, male and female are born in equal proportion. But if you ask any pediatrician, any doctor, who is a children's doctor, he will tell you that there are more deaths among the male children as compared to female children. Because the female child can fight the germs and diseases much better than the male child. So in the pediatric age itself, there are more females as compared to males. As life goes on, there are more male dying as compared to females due to cigarette smoking, due to alcoholism, due to war. So today in the world, there are more females as compared to males. Except in the third world country like India and China, etc., where the female population is less than the male population because of female infanticide. In India, according to Emily Becker, a British reporter from BBC, she says that every year more than one million fetuses are being aborted after the identified that they're females. So if you stop this evil practice of female fetuside, even in India, the population of the females will be more than the males. But in all the other countries, there are more females as compared to males. In New York alone, there are 1 million females more than males. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than males. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than males. And Allah alone knows how many millions of females are more than the males throughout the world. So if I agree with your friend, or the non-Muslim, that one man should only marry one woman. And suppose the market in America is saturated, that every man has found a woman for himself. Your sister, or my sister, happens in America. And if she has not found a life partner, 
The only option for her is that she either marry the man who already has a wife or she becomes public property. People say, public property is such a harsh word. It is the most sophisticated word I can say. There's no two options. Either you marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. So Islam has permitted polygamy, certain men to have more than one wife, to protect the modesty of the women. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum, assalamu alaikum, brother. I was quoting verses of Yadur Veda to my friend, uh, which talks about um, Shambhuti, Ashambhuti. And he was telling that uh, the meaning of Ashambhuti is not natural elements, it is um, natural things. Uh, so how can I prove him the meaning of Shambhuti and Ashambhuti is that only, which differs in the Veda? The brother asked a question that when he was quoting one of the quotations which I gave in my talk of Yajur Veda, chapter number 40, verse number 9, and that Prabhupada Nya Shambhuti Mupaste. That they are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti. Asambhuti are the natural things. So he's saying, how can you prove Asambhuti is natural and Sambhuti is not natural, it's created things? You can go to a dictionary. Suppose if I say that this word means this, fundamentalist, me the person who strictly adheres to the doctrine, disagrees, you go to a dictionary. I show him the Oxford dictionary and he's satisfied. You can go to a Sanskrit dictionary. We have got concordance in a library. We have got Sanskrit dictionaries also. If he knows, he can check up. You tell him. That's what I mentioned in a dictionary. Show him a dictionary. We have Sanskrit to English also. Sanskrit to Hindi also. And that will prove the point. Hope that's the question. He is claiming that he has read Sanskrit for two years. You ask him, what does it mean? You ask him, what does it mean then? If it doesn't mean natural or uncreated, what does it mean? You ask him. And tell him to give his proof. Na? Produce a proof if you're truthful. That is the translation given in their scriptures. You take a translation by Gifrit, Devi Chand, all these are Hindus and non-Hindu scholars have translated it. They translate like that. If you say it is not like that, you prove it. Not one. We have got five, six translations. And all five, six say somewhat similar. The choice of words may be different. You have to tell them when five, six translations are saying it means natural things, it means not created. Now you come and say something else. Who's right? And these people are PhDs and scholars in Sanskrit. Easy. Give them proof, take a Zeros copy of the Veda, the translation, give it to them. Any sisters have any questions? Is it that Itikaf should be done only in the mosque or can the women do it in their homes? According to the Hadith, the Sai Hadith, the scholars, they are divided. But the Salah scholars, those scholars who follow strictly Quran Hadith, they say since we don't find any Hadith, we say the women did in the house. But if and various hadith of the wives of the Prophet doing in the mosque, they say the etikaf should only be done in the mosque. There are some scholars, especially some Indian scholars, who say that etikaf can also be done in the house, but there's no hadith which gives evidence for that. Therefore, the view of the scholars which believe more in the Quran than say hadith, they say the etikaf should only be done in the mosque. But unfortunately, it's a pity that I don't know of any mosque in Bombay which permits women to do etikaf. They may be Allah Alam. I know there are several mosques. We do allow women to offer salah in the Tarawi. They have for Tarawi, but they don't have for Juma Salah. It is weird. See, Tarawi is not a fard. Juma Salah is a fard. I know they give the argument that because the mosques are so less and the men, where will they go to pray? So it is weird. More important should be Juma Salah, which is again not fard for the women to come, but it's more important than Tarawi. So we should have this movement of following Quran and Sahih Hadith. We should have mosques which allow salah for every day. Five times salah they should be allowed. Whether they come or they don't come. I don't know of any mosque, at least in Bombay. I know of mosques which allow in Ramadan, like Juma Masjid allows. There is a Heli Hadith, Bengali Masjid that allow in Juma. Alhamdulillah, I was shocked. I came to know. But only 20 women come. That was because close to Ramadan. Why? We should encourage this that they should have five times salah whether they come or they don't come. And if a woman wants to do etikaf, I don't know of any mosque. Well, I don't know in Bombay. Maybe Allah alam. First I thought that there were places. But now when I inquired the three, four places we do allow women for tarawi, I came to know they don't have any place for etikaf for women. Why? So we should see to it that we should educate these people who are running these mosques and tell them there should be place for women also to have etikaf. There should be place for women because see, when we go out, suppose we go for some work outside, and the time for salah is there, we immediately go to any mosque. What about the women? Where will they go? Where will they go? So don't women go out for work? For shopping or whatever it is? I don't know of any mosque 
at least in Bombay, there may be Allah Alam, I'm not saying there aren't, but I don't know of any, which has five times facility for offering salah for the women. We should have a separate place, let it be small. Let there be at least 10 or 20. So there are some mosques which have for Juma only. But I don't know if any mosque can. During Ramadan, I know the Jama Masjid has. But we should have places where women are allowed in the mosque for five times salah, whenever they require. And they should even have place for itikaf. Inshallah, when Allah gives hidayah, with the trustees of the mosque, they see to that they have a small place, separate facility for the women, inshallah, sister. But doing itikaf, if it's done, itikaf means leaving aside going to the mosque. So itikaf is normally done only in the mosque, sister. Hope that's the question. وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين فيا رب إنك أنت السلام منك السلام إليك السلام فيا رب إنك أنت السلام منك السلام إليك السلام لأمرك يرجع أمر الأنام بين يديك قلوب الأنام لأمرك يرجع أمر الأنام بين يديك قلوب الأنام The value of money in the hereafter will be measured by its proper use in the present. According to the glorious Quran, one of the best ways to use your money is to spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by spreading his message of Islam. Peace TV is a non-profit Islamic satellite television channel that is primarily dedicated for just that cause, the proper presentation of Islam. It's a great choice to invest in it and a golden opportunity to purify your wealth in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donations to IRFI Al Ryan Bank, 47 Calthorpe Road, Birmingham, UK, B151TH. Pound account number 011 IBAN GB49ARAY 3000830113230. Sort code 300083. Swift BIC code ARAY GB. B22. Please confirm your contribution at support at peacetv.tv. Support Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Soothing verses, awakening contents. Unlock your hearts. Let us start to reflect and interact with the glorious Quran through simple and interactive grammar exercises. Explore the secrets of success that exist in the blessed lines of the Holy Quran. Using what you recite every day and night, learn 250 words that occur 55,000 times or 70% words of the Quran. Let's understand the Quran. Let's join Dr. Abdul Aziz Abdul Rahim in. Let's understand the Quran every Saturday at 4 p.m. and repeat telecast at 2.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV.